Please welcome Dr. Brett Pyarski, Chief Scientist of DEVCOM, Army Research Laboratory's Computational and Information Sciences Directorate. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to uh, my UK uh, brethren. So my name is Brett Pekarski. I am um, at the Army Research Laboratory in the US. I wear a couple of hats. I'm a Chief Scientist in our Computation and Information Sciences Directorate. I also a Collaboration Alliance Manager for Consortium looking at distributed collaborative systems. And I also play a role uh, looking at scalable teaming for the autonomy community of interest uh, within the DoD. So today I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about uh, scalable teaming uh, uh, issues and concepts uh, for adversarial environments. I want to give a little few slides up front on some motivation for uh, scalable teaming and some of the problems uh, to be addressed and sort of my excitement for being part of today's uh, events. Uh, and then show you a little bit of work that we're doing within the Army uh, on the basic research side of things to kind of motivate you on some of the things that hopefully you'll be looking at over time. So first off, you know, future operating concepts uh, are very complex. As you can see on the right hand side, the Air Force, the Navy and the Army all have similar uh, operational concepts. They may be different environments, uh, but they all involve uh, multiple platforms, uh, heterogeneous platforms, scalable large numbers uh, of systems. And they're all operating across relevant environments. Of course, the, the services have different environments. Uh, they're all trying to provide better situation awareness, trying to provide standoff capabilities to the soldier, uh, increase coverage and dilemmas for adversaries, uh, provide force multiplication, faster decision making, uh, some of the things you're doing today, uh, and also extend maneuverability in the ways that you know we haven't even thought of because you know, we're still working on including robotic systems into these future concepts. Some of the things that you'll pull from those images um, are that one, you'll notice large numbers of systems. So we're no longer fighting with just a single system. We're fighting with tens of systems, to hundreds, maybe even thousands of systems. Uh, it's a heterogeneous mix, large, small, air, ground, systems with a lot of processing capabilities, systems with cell phone processors on them that can really only handle small algorithms, uh, small AI algorithms, uh, humans in the role, uh, multiple roles as commanders and bystanders, um, collaborative systems, of course, uh, systems that not only just move from point A to point B, but do tactical behaviors, they do dynamic tasking, uh, they're in contested environments, which means lack of infrastructure, which that could be GPS, communications, uh, loss of systems. Um, and then beyond that, we really need to look at the interoperability of these things, right? We're not only working between services, uh, but also multinational teams, right? So how do we get systems to work across those teams is a big challenge. Uh, busy chart, but there are basically three points here that the robotics and autonomous systems Right? They're going to have to assess scenes. Uh, they're going to have to create and share local and global information between them. Once they have that, then they're going to be able, they're going to need to coordinate actions and decisions and maneuver uh, uh, operations, not only between small teams, but across echelons and sub teams uh, and, and, and coordinating that with humans. And then they're also going to have to be a, a adaptive and resilient to large disturbances in the environment. So what happens if I lose half of my team? What happens if the, the building I thought was there is no longer there and it destroys my, uh, my perception or my navigation algorithm? So how do we be adaptive to these large disturbances in the environment? Most of the things that you see in industry today or commercially, uh, some very impressive things, like you can just look back as recently as the, uh, the Olympics where they flew 2,000 drones, right? Most of these systems are they're either small numbers or they're large numbers where they really limit the complexity, right? So environmental complexity, uh, they have known infrastructure, whether that's maps or they have GPS. Uh, they may be homogeneous platforms. They're single task missions. Uh, they have limited representations of the world. They, uh, they are subjective to large uncertainty and errors. Uh, and the solutions tend to be brittle, right? So what we need to do for DOD and, our, and Army solutions really is look at many uh, scales of complexity, uh, not only uh, uh, operational complexity, navigation complexity, but mission complexity, the environmental complexity, and the adversarial complexity, right? And part of our goal is really to push on all of these axes of complexity at the same time so that we can uh, push the boundaries of all of those single bullets on the left uh, for real Army and, and uh, DoD relevant environments. Uh, the thing that I'm excited about today, right, these are words directly from the, uh, the announcement for the Swarm Challenge, right, is that you're looking at heterogeneous platforms of varying capability. You're dealing with the fog of war, right? You know your initial positions, but you don't know your adversary. You, you're dealing with AI agents that need to learn over time. Uh, you're understanding that collaboration across the swarm will be critical. 
you're dealing with dynamic tasking, looking to put the right type of drone in the most appropriate role and sharing information. So all of these things are very relevant to the things that we're trying to do. So I'm really excited to, uh, to see, be part of today's events and to see the results as they come forward. So these next set of charts I'm going to show you are some examples to hopefully motivate you and show you some of the things that we're working with on the programs that I work on uh, and uh, to kind of look at how we're getting after some of these problems. So first is multi-situation awareness, multi-agent situation awareness. So we're looking at not only just metric information, so geometric information, but also semantic information and how do we combine metric and semantic information into uh, joint representations and how do we do that uh, lightly so that we can share that with platforms with, with small amount of processing capability and then use that for planning. So when we're doing that, we're also looking at things like multi-robot, uh, looking at uh, alignment of objects. So as multi -ro multiple robots look at the same objects, how do you align and, and deal with uncertainty and represent that I am looking at the same uh, object? Uh, looking at how do we deal complex three-dimensional representations and layered hierarchical representations so that we can use that in planning and navigation purposes. So an example of that is this chart in the bottom middle where we're looking at hierarchical official planning. And this is an example where we're telling the robot, uh, you know, move stealthy, hug the buildings, right? So in this green area, you can see that the navigation from point A to point B actually hugged the building as it went through. We could also say, move stealthily, move through the trees, and that navigation would move through the trees to point B versus just a line taking the shortest path from point A to point B. And by in integrating semantic information, we can do that. So I'm gonna play a short video here uh, that's gonna show you some uh, results from that. So this is some work out of MIT uh, looking at that. So this initial part is just showing you uh, developing the semantic maps for a single robot uh, moving through an office environment. As I move up here, I'm going to kind of skip through the video for the sake of time. Um, so this video, this is right here, it's a simulation environment. So we use Unity a lot. So this is a Uni simulation environment. We're processing moving this to real robots and, and the same environment you see in the simulation environment. But this is three robots moving through a somewhat semi-urban uh, uh, environment, creating a shared a semantic geometric map of, of, the, of the world. Uh, and if I move further down here, uh, you can see the same thing happening in a dense urban environment where I have multiple robots moving through the dense urban environment, creating a shared map, doing loop closures, and identifying, you see on the upper right, you see a list of buildings and awnings and signs and bridges, things that it's classifying as it moves the environment. And so how do we do that uh, between agents and uh, quickly and um, uh, sorry, let me move to the next chart. So we also need to do that resiliently. So a lot of what you're doing is going out and looking for the adversary. We need to do that uh, in a resilient flat fashion and a collaborative fashion. And we have to deal with failures along the way. So some of the work we're doing is looking at how do we reconfigure the, the communication graph when we lose sensors. So think of it if I have uh, multiple platforms, they could be heterogeneous or homogeneous, they have sensors on them. What happens if sensors start to fall on a single platform or multiple platforms? How do you reconfigure that communication graph so that you can maintain a level of capability or sensing capability across the group, even though some sensors are failing. Uh, and this short video just kind of shows that happening where the, the, the communication graph is, is changing, it's adding edges uh, based on loss of certain sensors. And eventually enough sensors will be lost that it can no longer complete the mission and the, and the mission is complete. Um, also looking at um, algorithms where we understand worst case scenarios. So a lot of uh, search algorithms um, are based on uh, uh, greedy methods to say, go out and look and find the most objects, um, but they don't really con consider loss or resiliency as part of that solution. So what happens in this case is that we're looking at worst case uh, searches. So understanding that we're gonna lose systems and planning for that, uh, and then using greedy approaches on top of that as a second stage. And what that allows us to do is get very efficient um, uh, maneuver. So in this case, so I have multiple robots. So you can see there the blue uh, is showing the blue square, yellow showing the yellow square, red showing the red squares. Uh, the magenta and the green circles UAVs up in here, they don't have uh, squares underneath them, which means their sensors are either occluded or blocked or failed. And over time, this algorithm will allow for sensor failure, occlusion of sensors, and still allow the, the track in the white uh, uh, dots moving around are basically adversarial agents that are being tracked. It allows us to track the most agents uh, with the, the number of platforms that we have 
and plan for the fact that we're losing sensors along the way. So we need to be able to build robust sensors that allow for sensors that happen automatically or maybe uh, that happen because an adversary is jamming us or, or, or defeating platforms along the way. Um, we also need to look at scalable active information acquisition. Uh, we need to be able to do that efficiently. Uh, we need to be able to combine that. So we not only look at physical space, we look at information space. And we also can look at things like energy. And this video is not really, it's hard to tell what's open in this video, but this is what's happening. We have agents exploring uh, or an urban environment. They're looking for uh, objects in that environment. And we're optimizing based on uh, the space covered, the information gained. And we can also add in things about energy expended in, as part of that active information gain. So how do we do that efficiently, computationally efficient, uh, that's scalable to, to numbers beyond 10, right? So as we get, start to get the numbers around 10, some of these methods begin to fail. Let me go back. So uh, as I mentioned, communications. So communications uh, between swarms and team members is a huge uh, issue. Uh, and we need to be able to look at that in an integrated fashion. So a lot of the work that we're looking at doing and, and we're interested in is how do we do integrated motion planning uh, and communication design um, with constraints? So in other words, we need to understand the resources that we have at any given time. So given the platforms that we have, given the radios we have, what is the bandwidth uh, that we have to communicate? What is the information that we need to communicate? How much bandwidth is needed to communicate that at any given time? And how do we adapt that uh, amount of information that we're sharing given the context uh, at either locally or globally at any given time? So, how, and how do we uh, use that to affect uh, motion planning and maneuver operations? So doing this kind of integrated uh, motion planning and communication network design at the same time while understanding constraints is a, is a big issue in a, in a large area of research. Um, also in the bottom right, uh, interested in intermittent communication. So what happens if we start doing distributed systems where we can't communicate with each other all the time? Uh, and we need to look at intermittent communications where the robots are coming in the range only periodically. How do we share information across the network to do that? So we have programs looking at that. Uh, and in the upper right, if I play this video, uh, this is looking at um, you, you will have five robots in the perimeter here doing a perimeter defense operation in an urban environment. Uh, and then we have three robots in the middle providing communication. So this is using uh, con or CNNs uh, to really understand and learn uh, the communication network and to provide robustly. So as the robots on the perimeter are moving and are coming in, in and out of comms, whether that's because of structural uh, blockages, line of sight blockages, or because of range, these interior uh, nodes are adapting uh, to provide communi uh, constant communication between all the nodes within the network. Um, also adaptive task allocation, dynamic tasking, right? So as you start to send systems out, we need to be able to enter, like I sort of touched on this already, interleave task planning, allocation, scheduling, motion planning uh, for heterogeneous systems. We need to be able to do that. Uh, we need to be able to look at not only binary traits, uh, but also dynamic uh, uh, time varying traits. Uh, think, think of things like speed, uh, fit human fatigue. These are not binary states, right? They're, they're varying. So how do we integrate those? Uh, not only capabilities of a system like I have a gun, but features of that system like I have a gun and it can travel at certain speeds, variable speeds. How do I integrate that into my planning? How do I do not, in, in some of these uh, situations and, and missions, they're gonna be time constraints. So I need to be able to do good enough planning. Um, I might not have time to do optimal planning or I might not have the comp computation res resources to do optimal planning. So how do I do good enough uh, planning uh, given the resources I have and the time I have. And the video I'm going to play here is sort of an example of that. So we have uh, six platforms trying to get to six targets. Um, the robots don't know that there's a no-fly zone around the, the target, the goal to the left. Uh, they don't know that the river's there. Uh, they start to do a uh, task assignment based on the goals that are given to them. Uh, eventually, the, the ground robot will try to go to the nearest neighbor to help the, the, the platforms on the right get to the three targets on the, or three goals on the right. But it comes across the river and realizes it can't can't cross that river. So we have to dynamically retask based on the capabilities of the skill sets of that robot, uh, and it'll retask and, and assign an aerial robot to move to that goal on the right. Likewise, uh, in the upper left, there's an aerial robot trying to get to the goal on the far left, which is blocked by no-fly zone, and um, that's going there because that was the shortest uh, 
the closest robot at the time of assignment. Uh, but eventually the robots figure that out and they have to dynamic retask so that the ground robot goes to that goal and the area robot goes to the goal in the upper right. And eventually they get to all of the goals sufficiently over time. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to cover this, but we also look at how do we represent information. So large numbers of teams, as you start to scale up uh, platforms, how do we, how do humans interpret information? How do they perceive information? How do indiv different individuals perceive information? So how do we represent uh, that information to humans? Uh, we're also using uh, capture the flag environments to try to study that uh, and look at how human characteristics interact into the swarm uh, behaviors. Um, and then we get into adversarial engagement. So a lot of what you're doing with the capture the flag here, uh, we're looking at how do we scale uh, techniques and methods up. So in the far right, you know, looking at heterogeneous uh, characteristics, so defender speeds, defender skills, dynamic teaming operations, but also looking at strategies and, and, and what happens when we have asymmetric sensing. So in this case, we're trying to defend the green area. The blue uh, dot is the a UAV trying to defend the green area. The sensing range for the green area is this larger blue circle. We have a red dot or diamond coming in that's, uh, that's got a smaller red circle, but that's a sensing angle. And you'll see as this video plays out um, that initially the red can escape um, because of the sensing range. And for some reason, that video there, it's, it's gonna be playing. It can escape, but over time, the blue dot or the blue UAV begins to learn that if it waits, it can, it can pull the, the red uh, UAV, the adversarial UAV far enough uh, so that it can then capture the UAV before it leaves. Um, and then it learns interesting behaviors at the very end, even if it's in this sensing region here and it's close to it, it learns that it's better strategy for it to move back in to some waiting position to chase uh, and capture the red diamond. So there's some interesting behaviors that get learned when we start looking at these. And then we start to look at how do we scale these up so we're looking at uh, scalable cooperative team, team strategies, looking at one-on-one -on -one, uh, collaboration uh, strategies, looking at two versus one, and eventually scaling that up to use local zones. Uh, and this video is showing uh, sort of local zones and attacking, and that we can scale these up to looking at many defenders on a perimeter, attacking many uh, 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 intruders coming into that zone. Uh, we can also do wave attacks, uh, we're looking at computational efficiency, and we're also looking at what happens in the, when the adversary denies a resource. So I'm getting close to my time here. So what I want to do is, is play uh, a video here. This is from uh, work at UPenn looking at um, a communication and, communication and adversarial together. systems. We pose the problem of decentralizing a centralized policy as a search for both communication and action policies at the level of individual agents. We approximate these policy functions using a neural network architecture in which identical agents train together as a team. We then deploy the robots in teams of varying size, even larger teams than they were ever trained with. We evaluate our approach with a perimeter defense task. Our team of defenders move around a circle and try to block intruders from getting inside. Each defender knows only its own position as an XY coordinate and nothing about its teammates. In the hard version of the game, defenders also only see intruders within a restricted field of view. Each defender can broadcast a message to all teammates, but they have to learn what to say and not just how to act. Should robots summarize local observations or report their intended action or ask for help? How should what they choose depend on context? When we give the defenders a complete view of the intruders, agents learn to summarize their own XY position as something like a polar angle. They learn to omit information about attacker locations because it's common knowledge. When defenders have a restricted field of view, their messages begin to include additional information about the intruders they see. Learning explicitly task-oriented communication strategies allows our team to talk efficiently. They perform well even when messages are constrained to just one or two 8-bit values. In addition, the learned decentralized communication action policies remain effective in teams much larger than those seen during training. So I think I'm about, about one minute. So just to say that we're, we're, we're looking at using AI methods in a lot of these as leveraged, uh, looking at sparse representations, looking at how we do uh, abstractions and planning, uh, looking at we, how we can buy plan, uh, learning and traditional planning methods, uh, looking at resource allocations and wireless systems, uh, how do we use topical, 
graphical uh, maps? Uh, how do we learn from demonstration in a, in a variety of different ways? So there's many ways that AI and machine learning algorithms can support that. But in the end, what we need to do is get put it all together, right? We need to be able to combine all these things to look at uh, motion planning, human input, uh, behaviors like perimeter defense, uh, looking at resilient net sensing networks, wireless networks on demand, and how do we integrate all these things together? Uh, and we're looking at ways to do that. This is an example of using multiple perimeters, uh, perimeter defense games uh, to make that happen. And with that, I think I'm out of time and I appreciate this and I'm looking forward to participating in the rest of the day. Thank you.